receive more of you through this time. So we just uh, lift up everything to you this morning and uh, pray that you be glorified. Thank you and pray all these things here, son's name. All right, um, so yeah, we'll go into a time of hearing the word. Our guest speaker today is uh, Pastor Michael's very own father, uh, Pastor Chris Vogel. And so uh, let's welcome him with a, a warm round of applause. I was hoping to be able to tell you I was Michael's older brother, but uh, that, got, that got blown, not that you'd have believed it. No, it is good to be with you here today, um, as we uh, often are uh, joining you in worship. Um, yeah, we're the old folks sitting over there, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's good to be here. When we're not, it's because I'm either preaching somewhere else or I am, uh, I'm traveling. I do a lot of traveling for... Uh, for the denomination and for work that I do called Next Gen Pastors, uh, helping to, to create mentors to help uh, guys beginning ministry, church leaders, men and women, and uh, us old guys in ministry as well to encourage them in what we call soft skills and, and what, what helps with that longevity. But it's good to be here with you this morning and to turn to God's word and have the opportunity to bring it to you. But first, let's, let's go to him in prayer and then ask him to guide us through this. Gracious Lord, as we look in your word, we ask that you would look into our hearts to see where we need to turn from ourselves to you, where we need to embrace the truth of the gospel again, to see that indeed you are so altogether lovely you are worthy of all of our praise. And so in this time, our gracious Lord, let us rest in the truth of your son's death in our place, his resurrection, that through it, we would indeed leave here more equipped to serve you in the world in which you have placed us. For it's in Christ's name that we pray this. Amen. Well, before we look at the word itself um, and, and hear the reading of it, I want to ask you a question. What, what are your dreams? What, what dreams do you have? They, you might be at a point in life, either wrapping up education, having graduated, maybe in a, a job, and you're thinking, I want something else. What else is out there? What else can I be doing? So your dreams could be anything in the next year, five years, 10, 20 years down the pike. Our dreams are our hopes for the future, what we long to see and do. Now, sometimes... Uh, even as I was just prayed, sometimes we get a little cynical when we see the, the hopes we have for the future meet the reality of life. And reality at times can stifle those dreams an awful lot. And in that sense, dreams can become even a nightmare. When we think, what's the future hold? Not just for me. It's interesting. When we think of our hopes and dreams, they can be fantasies. I want to do this and be that, and it's going to look great. But when we think of the hopes and dreams for our community, the nation, the world, it can turn a bit more nightmarish. And for that reason, a lot of times when in, in movies and culture, when we think of what the future holds, it becomes a bit more dystopian, a bit more negative, and it's not positive necessarily. So much so as, as one person has quipped, the future is not what it used to be. Well, we use the word dreams in another context, too, don't we? We think of dreams as what happens in the night when we're sound asleep. And if I were to ask you, what, was your dream, what were your dreams last night? Well, there's a couple th things you would respond. One, they were weird. I'm not going to tell you what they were. Or, I have no clue. I don't remember. So it all depends. When we think of dreams, they can be fleeting, untethered to any reality. We don't give them often a whole lot of thought. Those two ideas of dreams are going to come into our passage this morning because we're going to be looking in Daniel 2 at a man named Nebuchadnezzar, a man who had plenty of dreams. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon about 2,500 years ago, uh, what's sometimes called the Neo-Babylonian Empire, the Chaldeans. He was at that time the most powerful man in his 
in that part of the world, in the ancient Near East at that time. With a snap of his finger, any dreams he had for the future could become a reality. He had that kind of power. And we meet him at a time, and here in Daniel 2, right after he and his armies have gone into Jerusalem, besieged the city because he wanted what they had, and he took it. And among what he took was, we're told, these four people, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, his friends sometimes, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they come up in the next chapter. He took them in what we would call today in a human trafficking ring. Um, They were his prisoners to do whatever he wanted to have them do. So he had those dreams of what his future would hold, whatever he wanted would come to bow. But then one night, and we find this out at the beginning of chapter 2, he has a dream in the middle of the night that wakes him up in a fright. Because what he saw, what he experienced, was unsettling. It was indeed a nightmare. And especially this is important because in the ancient world, and it's true in many other parts of the world as well, dreams are, the dreams you have at night are important. They tell you something. And so he was sure these dreams meant something. And so he called in his trusted advisors to help interpret his dreams. This was a common thing that would take place in the ancient world. But Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 2 had a, a, a little caveat. He said, I want you to interpret my, interpret my dreams. And his wise men and his counselors said, sure, tell us what your dream is. He said, no, no, because I'm so powerful and I can do whatever I want. I want you to tell me what I dreamed and then interpret it. Now, that's a hard task. No, that's a, an impossible task. So his advisors in, in verse 11 of chapter 2 said, the thing that the king asked is difficult. Yeah, no duh. And then he said, and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. It can't be done. Well, being the king, he said, fine. If you don't do it, I'll kill you. I'll cut down your house. Your kids will be dead. You'll all be dead. Now, how does that feel? The word gets back to Daniel and his friends who are among the counselors. Their lives are on the line. The sword, if you will, is at their neck. And Daniel says to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, guys, start praying. Again, God alone is the one that can reveal these things. And we don't know what he wants. Our lives are on the line. And so that night uh, they pray. And that night God reveals to Daniel what the dream was all about. And so we see in our passage, sure we see in our passage. Are you flicking it? Let me just make sure. It, the word off means it won't work. <laughs> now it works. Thank you very much. Hear now uh, God's word, Daniel chapter 2, verse 17. Then Daniel went to the house and made the matter known to Hanai, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that David, Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom wisdom, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might, and you have now made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. Now, as we look at this passage, what we're going to see here is is something really fascinating. You notice there's one dream. Now, the dream we find out in verses 31 and all is this great statue that appears and has a head of gold, a chest of of silver, a stomach of bronze, legs of iron, and the feet are made of a mixture of iron and clay. 
And then, as it describes that, out of, uh, out of the, the, the earth comes this stone that was not cut with human hands, and it crushes the statue, and it is turned to dust, and the winds sweep away the statue. And that, that stone, that rock, becomes a great mountain, and then fills the whole earth. That was the dream. But you notice there are two responses to that dream. There's Nebuchadnezzar's response. Nebuchadnezzar, here is the most powerful man of his age. What he saw reduced him to terror. Daniel saw the same thing. And what we understand from Daniel 1 is here is Daniel, an enslaved eunuch with a death sentence on his head. And he awakes and gives praise to God. The same vision the same reality, but his response is different. And why is that? Because that is how we are to approach that. It all comes down to how one sees, sees oneself, but even more, how one sees the God who is sovereign, who is at work in the world. There may be good reasons for our dreams of the future to become nightmares, but when we see the universe from God's perspective, terror gives way to praise. Dreams can bring peace. So with that in mind, let's take a look at, at what all that uh, is saying to us, how these dreams of the future can certainly give peace. There is peace because God reveals his power. We see that in verse 21. God reveals his power. Blessed be the name of the God forever and ever, ever who belong wisdom and might. Nebuchadnezzar was a man of great power and might himself. No one could contest that. He could control his destiny, but he suddenly realized for the first time, but it won't be the last, we see that later in Daniel, that he's not as powerful as he thought he was. There is one greater than he. And what is more so, he did not know what the future would hold. Knowing the future frightened him. Now, some of us like to imagine that we have that kind of power and that control, that I can set out and I can do anything. But I think almost all of us at one point or another, when faced with reality, recognize how powerless we really are. We're not as strong and as great and all-encompassing as we might imagine. That sense of powerlessness is reinforced when we look at the world around us. Now, around us seem to be these seemingly random occurrences and even as we see the outburst of evil can leave us quaking, wondering who is the next victim. Will I be the next victim? See, our dreams of a good future can easily come crashing down when a white supremacist targets African Americans in a Buffalo grocery store, when a deranged teenager storms into an elementary school in Uvalde, when a disgruntled patient breaks into a Tulsa hospital and murders his doctor, staff, and patience. The mnemonic actions of those grasping for power can leave us wondering when and where it might happen the next. But Daniel does not allow that kind of fright to frighten him. Now you could say, well, that's easy for him because he's living in a palace. His life's pretty good, but it really wasn't. Don't forget, Daniel well understood trauma. He was present for the, the devastation of his home, of Jerusalem. He saw it besieged. He no doubt saw friends and family, relatives killed in the battle. He was taken from his home, his body violated. And despite all of that, he is able to utter praise of a God who has might and power. When he saw the eventual downfall of Nebuchadnezzar with that great stone crushing the statue, and it becomes, I think Nebuchadnezzar was frightened because he knew enough of what the, the dream meant. And as it will be told, Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold, and then there will be other kingdoms, but all of that will be wiped away by this great stone that will encompass the whole earth. See, Daniel knew what the end was, but he also knew he wasn't going to see it. He realized where this was going. He recognized God's great power, but then saw indeed he was able to bless the name of God forever because something much greater was coming about. He understood that it was God who foreordains whatsoever shall come to pass. But at the same time, he recognized, you look in verse 23, it says, To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise. He includes that covenantal concept. 
That idea that God is a God of our fathers, of our family, that we are connected and related and adopted and brought into this relationship. That despite how terrible it is and may be down the line, we can rest in the assurance of God's fatherly care. That was enabled him to wake up from a frightening dream and sing praise because God is a personal and a good God in, in the midst of horror. See, we can face, um, we can have peace in the face of an uncertain future because we know the end of the story. In verses 37 and 38, it describes, you know, what this all means. This dream of successive kingdoms that rise and fall is a sobering reminder in our story that indeed, this is not just the story of God will bring benevolent leaders. Things will turn out great in our lifetime. We can rest assured of peace and ease. Daniel had no sense of that. The threatening of Nebuchadnezzar to kill all the advisor and wipe out their homes still existed. So much so in the next chapter, we see him, Nebuchadnezzar, do this all over again when he erects a statue to, of himself and asks, and no, he doesn't ask. He demands all bow before him. And in that story, if you recall, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel's friends refuse to worship Nebuchadnezzar or his statue and are thrown into a fiery furnace to be burned alive. And they're willing to take their stand because whether they live or they die, they will not do that. No, indeed, they understood that in the, uh, having faith in God who is in control when the, peer, when the world appears to go haywire is at the core of what it means to trust God in all situations, whether they're cataclysmic or just your life is in turmoil. Wondering about a job, will there be a family for me? What, what's going to happen in all of this? Nebuchadnezzar was far from a benevolent leader. He had that power. And so it's not as though Daniel says we should, you know, rejoice in whatever powers that be because God is sovereign. No, there is a call to, to seek justice and mercy in the world. But at the end of the day, not to sense the weight and the fear and the terror only on our shoulders, to know where we can take it, to rest in those words of Jesus in John 16. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. No, we can have peace because God reveals his, his power. We can also have peace because God reveals his, his wisdom. Verses 21 and 22, you see the word wisdom come up again. It's power and wisdom. It's both he is, is able to do it and he is kind and gracious. It's not one or the other. When it says he changes times and seasons, removes kings, sets them up, that's the power. But he also, in verse 21b, gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what's in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. See, to face an uncertain future is not the domain of, you know, people that are, you know, been just uh, raised on Disney movies and happy endings and, and taken a lot of glucose. You know, they're on a sugar high. Everything is rainbows and unicorns. Not at all. The ability to praise God in the face of a frightening future depends not on the way we're wired or our personality or how we're raised, nor is it based on, I'll just be ignorant of really what's going on in the world and just think about myself. None of that is what's here. Facing an uncertain future comes from understanding what God has revealed about himself. It comes from that intimate relationship with a sovereign and loving God. See, when we seek to make sense of our world, of our age, and, and we do it apart from understanding of God, what, what happens? We can certainly become cynical. But I think more often, I think that is one of the responses, but one of the deeper, more hidden issues is not just cynicism. That's what we show externally sometimes. It's anxiety. It's fear. And, and Nebuchadnezzar was demonstrating a lot of anxiety when he could not sleep that night and he needed to know the future. There is an anxiety because the future is coming upon us. And part of it is it's coming upon us so fast. Fifty years ago, there was a book written by a sociologist, a futurist, if you will. Um, his name was Alvin Toffler, and the book was Future Shock. 
And as a, as a young teen, this was required reading in, in schools, and, and I loved it because here's a guy, you know, in the late 60s going, this is what the future is going to look like. And we went, wow, that's what it is. But it, it was interesting. This book is still in print because a lot of what he's saying, not so much the predicting of what's coming, but the understanding of how this affects society, the, the shock that the future brings to society. It's at the core of the book. They, even, uh, they made a movie out of it, which is, you know, if you ever go on YouTube and look at it, it's, it's really wild. It's been in 72, and you'll go, wow, they had really bad movie-making skills back then. It's, it's, it's amazing. But in that book, and, and Toffler is the guy that came up with the phrase, or popularized at least, the phrase information overload, and we still talk about it. Well, listen to what he said 50 years ago. Our galloping technology introduces change so rapidly... Okay, that was going to be up there. That's okay. Um, our technology, um, it, it, our galloping technology introduces change so rapidly that human beings experience a dizzying disorientation. We rocket society into an environment so ephemeral, so unfamiliar, so as to threaten millions with adaptational breakdown. That was said 50 years ago, and people are still feeling it. Things are moving so quickly. What's going to come up next? How am I going to respond to all of this? The future seems so uncertain because change is occurring in our lifetime at a pace we do not recognize. And that produces anxiety. I, I recall many years ago, as I finished up my undergrad and I did my master's and went on, on for, for a terminal degree, graduate work, and I thought, you know, once I complete this stretch, I will then enter my career, and I will careen through my career, and it's going to be great. Got married and had kids. And I thought, you know, once those babies learn to sleep through the night, when they're three years old, they will gather at my feet and give me nothing but joy. I'll tell you stories about Michael later if, if, you, if you want to hear. <laughs> Anxiety kept coming. You know, career wasn't always what you thought. And kids are great, and I, they're all great kids. Oh, my kids are great, but it was hard. I thought, you know, once they're out of the house, and I'm recognizing in the last quarter of what life God has, wonderful life God has given me is I never get to that point. And that's not a bad thing. Now, that doesn't mean I should be anxious, but I need to keep coming back that God will reveal wisdom how to deal in that situation. There's never not a point in which I don't need his mercy, his grace to walk me through this. I need all of that to, to cope and to work. We vainly imagine that coping, that the wisdom God is, is going to give us, though, is to answer that question we always ask, especially when, it's, when life's troubling. When, when life's not going the way you want it to go, almost always we have but one question, why? Why are you doing this, God? Why did that relationship not work out? Why didn't that job come? I worked so hard. I was the perfect person for it. Why? But it's interesting here, and we see elsewhere in Scripture, God doesn't really give us that kind of wisdom. He doesn't tell us the wisdom, the, the wisdom God reveals is not why, but how to live in light of it. What's next in my life? And so this is what Daniel illustrates. It's how to respond when I see this uncertain future to return back to what it's all meant to be. What's at that heart of worship that we sang about? It's giving honor, praise, and glory to a God who is at work, and we don't understand the why. But we are told how to respond. See, this world lacks that perspective. We, they don't know the God who removes and establishes powers, nor do they know the God who reveals himself and shows us wisdom of how to live in light of it. There, there sits above our computer, um, the computer at home in the, in the family room, oh, one computer, little plaque Janet made, put it off in the printer with a nice little cute font, put it in a frame as a reminder. She heard it in a sermon, and, and uh, it was a good sermon. It wasn't mine. Um, that's why she printed and put it up there. But it's a great phrase that just says this. It says, worry is the belief that God will get it wrong. Bitterness is the belief that God did get it wrong. Let me say it again. Worry is the belief that God will get it wrong. 
That's why we worry. We don't think God's going to do what he will do best for us. And bitterness is a belief that he got it wrong. It shouldn't have happened. But see, that's where the wisdom of God comes in, knowing that God does all things for his glory. And it's all done in light of eternity. There is peace because God reveals not only his power, his wisdom, he reveals what eternity is all about. And we see this in in verse 35. When it says, then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold, all together were broken to pieces and all and became like chaff of the summer threshing floor. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. God's eternity is, is shown there. It's shown that this something is going to come about. But again, in the context for Daniel, knowing it's, it's not just Nebuchadnezzar, the head of gold will be destroyed, but the coming empires will be. It's going to outstretch our lifetime. Now, there have been, there's a lot of ink spilt in, on this passage. You know, what was the, the, the bronze or the silver chest? It could have been the Persian Empire. What's the, the bronze and, and the Greeks? And, it, you know, it was the Rome iron? We don't know. It's, we're not sure how prophetic this is of exact events leading the future, but it is clear that it's talking about what the world will be. In some ways, it's a lot like trying to predict who the Antichrist is. And in Revelation, uh, churches and theologians and pastors have tried to guess that throughout the years. The early church thought that the beast, the Antichrist, was the Roman Empire, was Nero. Medieval church said it was the Islamic Empire that threatened Christendom. During the Reformation, the reformers thought it was, the, the, it was Rome. A generation ago, when I was young, it was the Soviet Union. Poof, it's gone. But then something else comes along. There always is something else. And having that reminder that God is sovereign in the midst is so critical. A number of years ago, I was in, in Kiev um, teaching at a, at a, a seminary there and was spending some time with a, a pastor in, uh, in, in Kiev. He had shown me a picture of the church that he pastored in, in, in the Donbass region, eastern um, Ukraine. A beautiful building that the church he started and built up and then he showed me another picture. It was just crumbled ruins. Because in 2014, well, the Russians had come in and used it for target practice. He and his congregation escaped that, you know, seven years ago from Donbass and had relocated in, in Kiev. And when I just asked him, I said, so, you know, I don't know if I came right out and I asked him, didn't have quite that gall. I just said, so what do you think of Putin? And he said, he is the Antichrist. I went, okay, okay, I think I understand, you know. And then he kind of stopped and smiled, you know. And he said, well, he is like the Antichrist. Okay, you know, understand. But he had the reality, the disillusionment of all those man-made dreams of what he wanted to see come about for he and his people, the lives they wanted to lead, came crashing down. And that was seven years ago. And it's still continuing. See, Daniel points to a time in the future when one will come uh, who will establish this new kingdom. And it's not going to be one done by human hands. We will not accomplish it. Should we work towards it? Absolutely. Should we expect that we will do it? That the hubris, the pride in that understanding is hard to encapsulate. No, Daniel declares this enduring power of God's kingdom. So that means we do not allow these, these pessimistic voices who see just the crumbling statue, but ignore the growing mountain. The power of the gospel is what's being described here. The, the rock, the early church always understood to be Christ. Even in the Old Testament, this, that picture of, of this rock as the Messiah, of the one who is coming, who is going to establish peace. We see it in 1 Corinthians uh, 10, where Paul's talking about the rock in the wilderness um, that Moses struck and the water at Meribah came, and that, that, uh, that later he was to speak to it, but he struck it again, and that, that rock, Paul says, that rock that followed them through the wilderness was Christ. 
That same image comes out again in, in Psalm 118 when Peter in Acts chapter 4 is, is, is proclaiming the gospel. He, he says that, that Christ is the stone the builders rejected. He is now the cornerstone. So much so that because of him there is salvation and no one else for there is no name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Isaiah 28 likewise talks about this rock is a rock of stumbling and it will crush this understanding throughout the old, seen in the Old Testament, brought up again in the New Testament, is very much what's being described here. That this is the gospel at work. Certainly Christ, the one who died for our sins and was raised from the third day, that understanding of, of what we celebrate um, every Lord's Day gathered together at the resurrection. But it doesn't stop there. The resurrection leads to the ascension, leads to, to, to the spirit coming at Pentecost, leads to this growing expanse of God's kingdom. And it's in that we can find our hope because of looking to Christ and his work of grace. You see, in, in Daniel's time, as well as ours, people don't usually dream sweet dreams of the future. Their dreams can be nightmares because of the uncertainty. Anxiety can reign high. Our, but our world hungers not for a dream, or they do hunger for a dream, but that's not a mirage. They hunger for desire truth, not a fantasy. And it's that truth that we can provide, not only for our own hearts or those that we know and love, but to those around us. We can proclaim, indeed, a gospel of hope where anxiety can be palpable. This is how the exiles survived captivity in David's or Daniel's day. The prophets gave them a theology of hope. The early church survived persecution under the Roman Empire because they had a theology of hope that came out of the Gospels, out of a resurrected Christ. And so we need to stand out like beacons so that we can say along with Daniel, blessed be the name of God forever and ever who, to whom belong wisdom, understanding, in might. Now, before us on this table is a physical, tangible picture of what that hope really is all about. And these simple elements of bread and wine, we see, we taste and see God's goodness for us. But it's not just what it's signifying is really eternity. It's signifying something that we are waiting for. It's pointing us to the, the marriage, the great marriage feast of the Lamb, when all of God's people who have died before us and we with them join together and celebrate the kingdom of our God has come in its fullness, in its reality. And right now we have this strange little taste still foretaste and going, it's coming. So even now as we gather together, recognizing we are doing what, what those who have gone before us have done likewise as they have gathered around the table, but even more, they are those who have gone before us who are in heaven waiting for us all to come together, gather around the table. We ascend, if you will, into the heavenlies for this great celebration. That's what it's pointing us to. So when you eat, you think of this is where we're going. We're heading to a great feast. But not only that, it's, we call it a sign. We call it a seal. It, it seals us. It guarantees us. It's not what saves us. But when our faith looks to the truth of the gospel and says, God is nourishing me. His power, his wisdom, and for eternity, I have peace that I can rest and trust in him. And so as we come to the table, I encourage you to, to, to consider once again what, what this means. If, if you are one who is trusting in Christ, you've been baptized as one of his in the body of Christ, the church. Remember in good standing of a, of a church that proclaims the gospel, I invite you to come and to participate. If for any reason you're, you're at that point in life, you're kind of searching, trying to figure out what, what does all this mean? I encourage you as the elements come by, let them pass. But I would love to talk with you, one of the leaders here, to speak with you about what this means, how you can have rest and peace in an anxious world. Scripture tells us that on the, the night in which Christ was uh, betrayed, 
he took these common elements from the Passover meal and he took the bread after giving thanks he broke it said this is my body which is for you after the supper he he took the cup and said this cup this cup is the covenant the new covenant in my blood my death in your place my body broken so that you may have life now come and celebrate together all that has happened i'm going to pray and those who are helping to serve come forward Let, let's Stop and take a moment praying these common elements to be used for this special purpose. Our gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for we come to you not on our own skill and abilities, but because of your grace, your mercy. Christ's death in our place, his resurrection means new life for us. So let us eat and drink to your glory, finding that peace here at the table. As the family gathers together, knowing you're here, you're at work, and we rest in you. For all this, we give thanks and praise in Christ's name. Amen. Again, hold the elements till we are all served and we will take together. <laughs> 